If being unlucky in love is an excuse to create a great country song, then I must be a Nashville superstar by now. I'm a musician, but that kind of success has yet to happen for me. Don't get me wrong, I love what I do, and I'm not in it for the money, success, or fame. But my career as a clubbing and touring musician hasn't led to eternal happiness in the love sphere. It's not that I've never been in love. I have three times. Or rather, I've been in love three times, but only on one of those occasions was I in love, but none of them worked out. And so today I'm doing again what I've done thousands of times before, getting up on the stage of some country western bar to play my music, and the music of many people more famous than me, so that other people can have a good time with the ones they love. A long time ago, when I was just starting down this path, I had dreams of walking out on stage, big or small, and a beautiful woman would sit up front and watch me play. She would smile at me, and I would wink at her. She would be the love of my life. She would be proud of me and what I do, and I would be proud to have her in my arms at the end of the night. Too bad it didn't work out that way. As far as local musicians go, I'm doing pretty well. I make good money, and when I perform, the hall is usually full. I have some CDs that I've self-released and some T-shirts that I've printed, and they sell well. When I play, I see and hear the crowd singing along, and not just to the covers I play, there are people who know the words to some of my original stuff. Right now I live in a van, which allows me to be free on the road and not have to worry about an apartment at home. I'm usually able to find an inexpensive parking lot where I can plug in, but there are times when I can't do that for a few days. It's a lonely existence, but I've already accepted that this is my reality and my future. It's the payment for doing what I love, and I don't think I'm capable of doing anything else. Not anymore, anyway. I've been married once. I was 20 years old and already a working musician. I dropped out of high school with my grades I wouldn't have graduated anyway at 16 and went on tour to play music. I had to lie about my age until I was 18. My parents were divorced and spent more time looking for their next ex-girlfriend or ex-boyfriend than they did for me, so I rather think they were glad when I was gone. I can't be sure, as I haven't seen or spoken to either of them in over 15 years. I met my wife, Kelly, at one of the clubs I played at. She was there with a bunch of friends and I saw her on the dance floor. Damn, she was hot. She was tall, five and eight, with an athletic build and a wild mane of blonde hair. She knew how to move, and all the guys she danced with seemed to appreciate her as much as I did. At this time, I was playing rhythm guitar for a guy named Hal Harris. Hal was an older man by now, and most of his traveling was behind him. He was well-invested and owned land around Waco, Texas, so he could run his schedule the way he wanted. The downside was that the rest of us had a hard time paying the bills because he didn't play often enough for us to make a living. But we did it for the experience, not the paycheck. In between gigs, I used to go outside for some fresh air. And on one of those breaks, I caught Kelly outside already doing the same thing. She was just leaning against the wall and running her fingers through her hair, trying to cool herself down. It was one of the most erotic sights I had ever seen. Just for the sake of interest, I decided to introduce myself. How glad I was that I had done so. Good evening, ma'am. My name is Henry. I saw you on the dance floor. I'm glad you like it. Good evening to you too, Henry. I'm Kelly. Yeah, I'm having a good time. You guys have a good sound. You seem to be dancing with different people. Is your boyfriend okay with that? She smirked at my obvious ploy. I don't have one right now. Are you interested in the position? As a matter of fact, yes. We'll be done here tonight at midnight. Would you like to grab a bite to eat at Denny's? I'd love to, Henry. I'll see you after the show. I fell in love with her from that first date. I don't mean lust. I knew what that was, and it wasn't that. I felt energized every time she touched me. She was smart, funny, and beautiful. God, she was beautiful. And I wanted to be with her every minute of every day. After a month, I moved out of the room I was renting and moved into her one-bedroom apartment. It wasn't much, but it was enough for us. She was working as a dental assistant, having gotten a certificate from one of those professional schools that they advertise on TV all the time. That was the only snag in our relationship. She worked during the day and I worked at night. But she would come to many of my shows and hang out during breaks until it got late and she had to go to bed for work. Many young couples did the same thing, spending time together when they could, 
and we did our best to manage it. The sex was amazing, not just because of what we were doing, but because of how we felt about each other. When I was with her, I felt like I was entering another plane of being. She wasn't a virgin, and neither was I, but neither of us were very experienced. We learned a lot together, and it brought us very close as a couple. I proposed after only three months, and we were married a month later. Neither of us had a big family, but we had a few friends, and Hal gave us a weekend in Vegas for our honeymoon as a wedding gift. I'm pretty sure we left the room at some point, but I don't remember exactly how. We definitely practiced the bed, though. It was perfect for about nine months. And then the bombshell hit. Hal was retiring from acting, and I was out of a job. Kelly was getting by, but she wasn't making enough to support both of us. But a musician's life is fleeting. I was fine with Hal for a while, but now a music career meant a life on the road, whether I was playing with someone else or trying my hand at a solo career. Not wanting to stay away from Kelly, I tried to find myself a real job. Not having any skills, I was only able to get a job as a cashier at a local department store. I was doing well, but I hated it, and that eventually manifested itself in my time alone with Kelly. No matter how much joy she brought me, it couldn't completely drown out the depression I was feeling over my career turnaround. Finally, she got fed up. Baby, you're so miserable. I think you need to get back to music. Honey, I told you what that would mean. I'd be on the road most of the time or playing at night. I'd never see you again. I know, but you'd be happy again. We can work things out. I hate seeing you like this. You're no longer the happy, fun guy I married. I ended up hooking up with a band called Palomino Jones, whose guitarist had just quit and moved to the Northeast. And as I knew it, my life turned into a life on the road. At first, the peak was sex upon returning home. He and I would rape each other whenever I came back to town. But as time went on, it slowly began to subside, and I sensed a change in our marriage in general, and in Kelly in particular. She was still happy to see me when I came home, but something was missing. The end came on Friday. There was a note hanging on the bathroom mirror asking me to get to the concert a little early so we could talk. She would meet me there right after she got home from work. The concert was local, and I was happy to know she would be there, but worried about the conversation. I realized this as soon as I walked in because I immediately saw my wife sitting in the same booth with another guy. Outwardly, they were not affectionate, but they were sitting very close, too close for my comfort. She straightened up when she saw me walking toward their table. What's that? I asked. Who the hell are you? He just looked at Kelly and she looked at me. Henry, let's find a quiet place where we can talk. She slipped out of the cubicle and we went through the employee door and into the back room to find some quiet place. She didn't meet my gaze for a long time. She didn't even need to utter a word. So that's it. It wasn't a question. Suddenly tears came. Henry, I'm so sorry. I miss you so much when you're gone. I'm not strong enough to be a musician's wife. I thought I was strong, but I'm not. I need someone to be home with me more often than he is. You're the one who told me to go back to music, to hit the road. I know, I had to. You were so miserable in that job, and I really thought I could handle it but I was stuck, Henry. Either I was without you 75% of the time, or I had a depressed and miserable you the whole time. You are who you are, Henry, and I love you too much to let you change that. There was no way I was going to win. Who is this guy? His name is Bo. I met him at my job. He works at a convenience store at the other end of the mall. I don't have feelings for him like I do for you, but he's always by my side at night and he's in a good mood. I used to spend time with him while you were on your trips. You know I love you, but it didn't work out between us. I'm so sorry. Did you? No, Henry, I wouldn't do that to you. I respect our marriage and our vows. I told him straight out that I wouldn't do it until you and I divorced. The tears were coming fast, I think, for both of us. Hal always told me that the life of a musician is hard and lonely. And you better get used to loving your music because chances are it will be the only woman for you for a long time. When I met Kelly, I thought he was wrong. He was right, and he probably knew it. But he also knew it was a lesson I needed to learn on my own. Okay, Kelly, 
If that's what you want, I won't stand in your way. Let me know when you get the papers. I'll sign them. I'll find a place to stay tonight and come get my stuff tomorrow around noon. I'd appreciate it if you weren't there. It would only complicate matters. It's not exactly what I want, but... She was speechless, but I realized what she meant. I hope, Henry, you won't take offense. By the time we continued on, she and her new boyfriend had already left. I could barely concentrate and my voice sounded like shit, but we got through it. I apologized to the guys afterwards and told them what had happened, and they were cool about it. I stayed with Milt, the drummer, that night. I think if there was a silver lining to all of this, it was that I wrote a song that eventually became my defining hit. It was called No Hard Feelings, and the chorus went something like this. I hope there are no hard feelings, she said. I replied to her that there are no hard feelings, that's true. But that's only because I can't feel at all, thanks to this heartbreak you've caused. Back to the present. When I'm introduced and take the stage, there's a standing ovation. I've performed at this club a few times now, and it's gotten to the point where I'm here one, two times a month now. My current band has been around for about three years now. It's a bunch of young guys, just like I was when I was on the same stage as Hal Harris. It's funny how life goes by. Although I'm not as old as Hal, I'm 36, in case you were wondering, I've turned into a seasoned veteran of the music wars giving advice to the young guys. Eddie, who plays bass for me, calls me Obi-Wan, a reference to the Star Wars character. I like that. I have a few songs that are going well, but none that get as much reaction as No Hard Feelings. I play it every night because my fans expect to hear it, and every night it hurts me. Maybe that's why it's so popular. The pain I feel every time I sing it manifests itself during the performance, as fresh as the night Kelly left me. It's been 15 years, and I still love her with every fiber of my being. After my divorce from Kelly, I didn't have another long-term relationship for about five years. I was 27 and spent most of that time traveling. I live, for lack of a better term, in Austin, but that means that's where I have a mailbox and my friends live. But that doesn't mean I didn't have female companionship. The fact is, I could sleep in every night, and maybe even twice. But that's not my style. Don't get me wrong. I used it, but only when I really needed it, or on those occasions when I was particularly taken by the beauty of a woman. But those occasions were rare. My second serious relationship began, where else? In a club. She worked at the bar, and after the place closed, we went out to eat. Eventually, all the other patrons apologized and went home, leaving just Allison and me. As I found out, Allison was 26 years old and had long, straight brown hair. She was pretty flat-chested, but her body had tantalizing shapes. We ended up sitting in the restaurant for several hours, ordering breakfast and eating dinner again. Finally, she slipped out of the booth and announced that it was time for her to go home and go to bed. I thought we were saying goodbye until she looked at me rather cheekily and said, Would you like to join me? Allison was just an amazing slut. She had tons of energy even after we'd been up all night. Unlike Kelly, who I fell in love with immediately, Allison was more long-winded. We started with wild, promiscuous sex, and then the feelings grew and we spent every minute I was in town together. I even had my own key to her apartment. Every time I went out of town, we would discuss my schedule in detail, and she would be ready and waiting for me when I returned. Our feelings for each other grew deeper, though I never seriously considered marriage. I was afraid that bridge had already been burned. Maybe someday. The sex each time, give or take a few surprising moments, was just as amazing as that first time, though it didn't have the connection I'd experienced with Kelly. But I imagined it would be. This time it ended up being a misunderstanding. Or maybe it was just a mistake. I never fully understood how it happened. When Allison and I first started a serious relationship, I told her about the problems in my marriage and how my demanding schedule on the road had caused it to fall apart. Allison promised that it wouldn't be a problem for her. I have a very busy social life, lots of friends to spend time with. When you're out of town, I can use my time when I'm not working to rekindle those relationships. Some part of me actually looks forward to having free time and not being with someone who's around all the time. Thus, I was reassured. Before our last trip, we discussed my schedule as usual, and as we drove into town, I looked forward to seeing her. It was a long drive and temptations were many. 
But I knew what was waiting for me at home, and I didn't dare jeopardize that. Leaving my things in the car, I headed straight to Allison's apartment and unlocked the door with my key. Her car was parked downstairs, which meant she was here somewhere. She was, and unfortunately, not alone. As I rounded the corner and approached the bedroom, I heard the distinctive soft grunt that came from a voice all too familiar to me. I stood in the doorway watching a very naked Allison bouncing up and down on a guy named Hugh that we had spent time with in the past. Hugh noticed me first and managed to mutter, Henry. That was all he said when Allison spoke to him. You know the rules. No talking about him. I told you he won't be back until tomorrow. I guess that was my cue. Actually, a startled Allison suddenly looked at me over her shoulder, a look of horror on her face. I'm supposed to come back today. I think maybe you put it on the calendar wrong. Allison quickly pulled away from Hugh, and Hugh had the good sense to quickly gather his things and run out, not daring to approach me until he was sure I wasn't going to hit him. I just leaned against the doorframe and watched him walk past, then returned my gaze to Allison. I'm... I'm really sorry, Henry. I really thought you'd be back tomorrow. Would that have helped? She shook her head. Is that what you meant when you said you'd reconnect with your friends while I was gone? I hope you believe me, Henry, that wasn't my intention. At first, I did exactly what I meant. I went out with my friends and had a good time. But I didn't realize how much I would miss sex when you were gone. Before we started dating, I could have sex whenever I wanted. When we started dating, I was completely faithful to you, but while you were away, I wasn't prepared for how horny I got. I know you knew about how fucked up you were as soon as you got home. I knew about it. As with Kelly, the sex when I got home was amazing, and I told her about it regularly, and it never stopped being so, even on my last return, which didn't end with her on top of another guy. She continued, However, as time went on, it became too much. I met a friend of mine who married a musician many years ago, and they still live together. I asked what her secret was, and she said that she and her husband have an arrangement. She does what she needs to do to get her way, and as long as she behaves discreetly and he doesn't know it, they'll be fine. She always makes sure she's clean and their apartment is clean before he comes home. She picked up a napkin from the bedside table and wiped her eyes before continuing. It seemed like the perfect solution to me, baby, but I knew from your experience that you wouldn't go for it. I figured if I kept a close eye on your schedule, I could do the same thing without you knowing. I would be taken care of when you were gone, and when you were home, I would show you how much I loved you. They mean nothing to me. And now, I guess I wrote the damn day down wrong, and here you are. Can you ever forgive me? Can we stay together? I love you, Henry. I'm sorry, Ellie, I can't. Sometimes I wish I could be the guy that makes it work, but I'm not. And my life isn't going to change anytime soon. Even if you promise not to do it anymore, I'd have a hard time believing you. And the thing is, you either have to go back to it or suffer without it. Either way, it's not fair to you. So this is the end of us, Henry? I'm afraid so, Ellie. I'll pack my things and be on my way as soon as I can. I packed all my things. I hadn't officially moved yet, but there was enough stuff to make it seem that way. She was just sitting on the bed with a blanket covering her lower extremities, but her pretty little breasts were in full view while I packed my stuff. I set the bags by the front door. Henry, I know you've been on the road a long time. Would you like to, I mean, can we go again? I may have been devastated, but I wasn't stupid. But I made her take a shower first. And before she left, she gave me one more thing to think about. If you ever need to, you know, Ease your needs, Henry. I'm always at your service. You've been the best I've ever had. As long as my set lasted, the dance floor stayed busy. Tonight, the room was full and the audience was responsive. Lots of people were singing along and having a great time. Even the merchandise table, where one of the guy's girlfriends from the band sat on any given night, seemed to be doing a decent business. It was a good night, and it was having an effect on my melancholy mood. The second break of the evening was announced and I went backstage to rest and drink water while the guys went to get a beer. I never liked drinking and gave it up completely on my 31st birthday. It just ceased to interest me. 
and I strongly suspect it had something to do with the events of that evening. At that point, I was dating a woman named Janet. She was something of a free spirit, which I thought I needed at that point in my life, and I developed strong feelings for her. Again, not for marriage, but as strong as I was otherwise capable of. She was so much fun to be with and seemed to really pull me out of years of depression. She was a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend of one of the guys in the group, and they set us up on a blind date. Contrary to expectations, we really hit it off. By that point, we had been together for about nine months. Like Allison, I didn't actually live with her, but we had keys to each other's apartments, and I had a lot of stuff at her house. Physically, Janet was also very different from Allison and Kelly. Janet was almost six feet tall, and her breasts were very large, like a DD. She was chubbier than Allie and Kelly, who were slender and athletically built, although Allie had an amazing ass. Janet was much rounder around the middle, with thicker thighs. Our friends were throwing a party for my 31st birthday at one of the clubs where we performed every so often. They scheduled it for Tuesday night, usually one of the quietest nights for the club. The club owners allowed them to rent the space at a very reasonable price. I saw Janet at the beginning of the evening. She was enjoying her drinks, but it had been an hour or so since I had last seen her. Normally, this wasn't a problem as she was very social, but today was my birthday, and I wanted to spend time with her. Yeah, I know. And so I set out to find her. These clubs have a huge number of rooms, nooks, studies, and closets in the back of the house, and they all have a specific purpose. Many of them have a small room with a cheap bed that is used for a variety of reasons. Usually, it's either for a drunk to sleep it off, though often only if he's a regular, or for a worker to have a place to rest and take a break, or more often than not, for the owner to have a place to sleep when he's fighting with his spouse. It is what it is. On this particular evening, the place, as you may have guessed by now, housed my very drunk girlfriend and two, yes, two, of our drinking buddies, whom I didn't know and didn't remember seeing before. Friends of friends of friends, I thought. One of them got some nerve and said, Hey, buddy, you can ride, but you'll have to wait until we're done. While I was taking some pictures on my phone because I didn't think she'd remember much, Janet made an effort to see who the guy was talking to, and when she saw me, my heart warmed a little when she explained who I was. Hey, guys, this is my boyfriend. He's going to the front of the line. Gee, I was flattered. The guys, suddenly looking very nervous, suddenly had nowhere to go either. Janet looked at me through a drunken haze as they left and said, Looks like it's just you and me, babe. I tried to talk to her, but she was quickly becoming incoherent and soon passed out. I lowered her onto the bed and left her lying there naked, though I locked the door so she wouldn't be taken advantage of. I made a few more trips to the party, made sure she was passed out for a while, and then went to her place and got my stuff. I also sent her the pictures I had taken to explain why she and I were no longer together in case her memory failed her in the morning. She tried to apologize. She was drunk. She didn't mean it. She loves me, etc. I listened to her, assured her that I believed her and forgave her, but also made it clear that I could not continue a relationship with her. I couldn't forget. From that night on, I never drank again. It was getting late. The crowd had thinned out a bit, but it was still quite crowded. The girls working the kiosk were still trying to attract customers, God bless them, and the dancing had pretty much died down. Most people were just relaxing and enjoying the music, and I noticed a few people at the bar still trying to pick someone up at the last minute. As usual, I decided I had nothing to look forward to but another lonely night in the van. I had already started playing the last set when I saw her come out of the shadows and sit up front. It was my dream come true. I played some of my best songs. The night was coming to an end, and she looked me straight in the eye and smiled like she was more proud of me than anyone else. Kelly. I recognized her immediately. She hadn't changed much. My voice began to break from the rush of emotion. I hadn't seen her since the divorce was finalized. That was when we met one last time to say goodbye. I had heard that she had moved somewhere out west shortly after our divorce was finalized, but that was the limit of my knowledge. While I cleaned myself up to continue singing, I gave the boys an extended jam. It took a few minutes, but eventually I got through it. I glanced in her direction a couple times to make sure it wasn't a hallucination brought on by my musings this evening. If it was, 
It was the most real and persistent hallucination of my entire life. Each time, she caught my eye and gifted me with her beautiful smile. It was definitely her, and she seemed damn glad to see me. The boys realized at some point who I was looking at, but even though I'd told them a lot about Kelly, honestly, they'd never met her, so they didn't understand exactly what was going on, but they guessed that this woman was the reason for what was affecting me. As our evening of music came to an end, the audience broke into applause, and we left the stage feeling good about what we had done that evening. As we started to clean up the stage, Keith came up to me. We can handle it, boss. Go talk to her. I almost broke down right on the spot. I held out my guitar to him. Thanks, guys. You guys are the best. I got off the stage and walked over to her. She hadn't moved from her seat since the show came to an end, but stood up when I approached her chair. Her eyes clouded over and I felt my eyes become the same. Hey, Henry. She pulled me to her and hugged me. I didn't want to let her go, but I finally did. Kelly Conrad, I can't believe it's really you. Actually, Henry, it's still Weston. Buy a girl a drink? I don't think so. She was taken aback for a moment. Actually, I'm quite hungry. How about something to eat? I'd love to. I contacted the guys and they assured me that they had everything ready and could do whatever they needed to do. Eddie, the bass player, asked the question they were all thinking about. Is that Kelly? I nodded. You're right, boss. She's beautiful. Good luck. I turned back to Kelly and she took my hand as we left the club. We walked in silence to a late night diner just a couple blocks away. We were silent until we were seated, looked over the menu and ordered a light breakfast each. We were both nervous, hesitant to start a conversation, but it had to be done. How are you doing, Kel? I'm fine, Henry. How are you? Same as always, just older. You look good, even prettier than when we got married. Thanks, Henry. You've always made me feel good about myself. You look good yourself. You keep yourself in good shape. I try to exercise every day. As I approach 40, it's getting harder and harder. Believe me, I realize that. She paused. You have a great voice. I heard about it a few years ago when you finally decided to lead your own band. I knew you'd do it one day. Yeah, I'm tired of other people's whims. Being that guy is a lot harder, but it's worth it. Where do you live? I heard you moved somewhere out west. To Arizona, Tucson to be exact. I managed to get a job there. After we broke up, I just couldn't stay in the same town as you. I went out west because I knew you hardly ever toured there and it would break my heart to see you again. So things didn't work out with what's-his-name? Bo? I already told you I didn't have the same feelings for him that I had for you. He was a good guy and helped me, emotionally, I mean, through the divorce, but I left almost immediately. We never even, uh, you know, I felt bad about myself. He had been patiently waiting for me all this time, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I still felt like I was deceiving you. Weird, right? Not at all. Honestly, I was the same way. It was a long time before I could again, and it was more out of necessity than anything else. I didn't like it at all. I know you've had a couple of serious girlfriends. I cast a questioning look at her. I still had friends here, Henry. I asked them to keep me posted on how and what you were doing. That's how I found out you'd gone solo, too. Yeah, I tried a couple times. They both bullied me one way or another. After Janet, I decided love wasn't going to work for me. You never know, Henry. Sometimes, when you least expect it, I guess you're right. There was a pause as the food was served, and we each took a couple bites. This time, she spoke first. So, no offense is about me, isn't it? Yes, you're the only one who's ever made me feel so passionate and emotional, both good and bad. I'm sorry, Henry, I'm really sorry. I never meant to hurt you. Please don't apologize, Kel. You have nothing to apologize for. I've never once regretted meeting you or marrying you. Things were perfect for a while. Some nights I can't let go of the memories of our time together. You did what you had to do. As the saying goes, it's better to love than to lose. We paused to take a few more bites. I continued. You never changed your last name after the divorce? Did you expect me to? 
I guess I thought you'd go back to your maiden name or change it when you remarried. I didn't remarry, Henry. You are still my one and only partner in this adventure. That surprises me. You're such a wonderful person, Kelly. How could you not find someone to marry? Oh, the opportunities were there. I dated a few guys pretty seriously, and two of them even proposed to me. But I couldn't bring myself to say yes. Why? You deserve to be happy. She looked at me like I should already know. Because they weren't you, Henry. All the guys I've dated have been compared to you, and every time they've fallen short to one degree or another. I could certainly understand that. I was aware that my relationships with Allie and Janet never reached the heights they could have, simply because neither of them were Kelly. She continued, I never stopped loving you, Henry. I came here tonight. I wanted... Henry, I'm here to see if we can try again. I had to make a conscious effort on myself not to jump across the table and hug and kiss her. As much as I wanted to, logic and control had to dictate the pace, at least for the moment. I've always loved you, Kel, and I always will, but my life remains the same. 75% of the year I'm on the road or playing gigs. I don't even have an apartment. I live in a van. It's still the same life that was so hard for you back then. Nothing has changed. No, it has changed, Henry. I've changed. I've never been truly happy since I left you. There have been times when things have been better than others, but I've never come close to the happiness I felt just being around you. And I felt it again when I walked into the club tonight and saw you. It took me 15 lost years, but I finally realized that the only thing I want, the only thing I need, is you. I was getting emotional. Kelly, I... I'll find a good home for you, Henry. We'll travel together in the van. I'll come to all your shows. I'll cook and clean for you. I'll drive everywhere you go. I'll show you in bed every night how much I love you. I want you, Henry. I want our children. I can live any life I want as long as I have you. Please don't say no to me. All my doubts and defenses vanished. It was time to take another chance. After all, she was the only one I'd ever truly wanted. I slipped out of the stall, her wide open blue eyes following my every move, and knelt down in front of her. Kelly Weston, will you marry me again? Yes, baby, I will. We were both in tears, hugging each other. The other six diner patrons and the waitress showed their appreciation with applause. We paid the bill and went back to my van. We climbed into the double loft bed and set to work on these babies. Epilogue. Four years have passed since that fateful night. Kelly and I are both in our 40s now. Our schedule hasn't slowed down in terms of gigs. The band is still with me, except for Troy, the other guitarist, who has gone off on his own. He's very talented, and I think he'll do very well. Emily just turned three, and she's a toddler. Lucy is 14 months old, and the sisters are already best friends. Emily calls her my baby girl. Kelly got her tubes tied after Lucy was born mostly because it would have gotten too crowded in the van with another baby. Life in the van is cramped and hectic, but I wouldn't change it for anything. My three best girls are with me almost every minute of every day. I've released a couple albums nationally, and they're selling pretty well. I'm no Garth Brooks, but there aren't many of those. I've been able to provide a good life for my family, and we're happy. The kids are getting a pretty good education by traveling all over the country, and when they reach adulthood, Kelly will homeschool them, RV school. I'm saving as much money as I can. I'm trying to follow Hal's example and someday put down roots so I can live off my investment and do what I want to do. We haven't gotten there yet, and we won't anytime soon, but we're making progress every day. But at the end of the day, no matter what happens, I have the one thing I really want, my kids and my soulmate.